Psalm 46 is where we're going to be, part two of a three-part series that, Lord willing, we will finish up tomorrow. And then, of course, Pastor Mike will be on on Friday, Lord willing. And so I uh, want to encourage you with some words from the Psalms. As I have been doing this study, uh, some of these have been through um, passages that have been given to me. Others are through passages that I have found in my own study. Psalm 46, there was a, there were some verses that were given to me, and then through that I, I ended up studying through the whole psalm. Excuse me. And so um, that's, that's how we're, we're getting to these. But one of the themes that has really been sticking out to me as we have worked through these different things is just how often the children of Israel were under these intense um, struggles uh, under the siege of enemy, we're, we're, we're talking about that again in Psalm 46, yet different enemy than we talked about on Sunday. And there were so many times where God saw fit, uh, whether to punish for sin or whatever reason, to allow his children to be put under this this time of, of extreme difficulty and siege. And through that often we see uh, that that there was some some deep discouragement. And that's a normal thing, a natural thing, that we can become overwhelmed with with what's going on. Yet, I also see, as I've studied these kind of, uh, you know, one after the other, you see this pattern of, of discouragement and frustration. Yet, as the author begins to put his mind on God, then the whole tone of the writing changes. And so, we're just reminded so often about God. Uh, it's interesting to me even how often I have found myself in the Old Testament for these. As you know, there's there's quite a bit of time that we spend some time studying. We spend time studying in the New Testament uh, when we're together at church. We've been preaching through books in the New Testament, and yet here through this time we're we're in the Old Testament. Um, so here we are in Psalms chapter 46, and uh, just a quick review, uh, last week we looked at verses 1 through 3, and we looked at three declarations that we said, three declarations that would change your life. And uh, we lo- those three declarations were, God is our refuge, God is our strength, and God is our help. And then we, we looked at the idea of God as our help, as it literally says a very present help, a very, very specific and personal help. And so these are these declarations that the psalmist made. He said, God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my help. And then he says, because of this, I will not fear. Because of my view of who God is, I will not fear. And then he goes on to say in those other, in those verses there, that even if the earth is destroyed, I am not going to fear. And so again, I want to remind you, no matter what happens as we move forward, uh, it, it's, it might get bad. It might get worse. We might face even more economic difficulties. We might face even more health difficulties. But if we believe God to be who he says he is, we can, we can clearly and calmly say, I will not fear. So now we're on to verses four through seven. And here's what the psalmist says. He says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The the nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Uh, I love these verses. this, This entire psalm, Many of the Psalms are very poetic, very descriptive. And what I see here first in verse 4 is the fact that God, we see this idea of God's presence, God's presence with his people. And uh, in in verse 4, I see that God's presence brings contentment. And and so we're going to talk through that again. Verse 4 says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. And there's a significance here to this idea of the river, and I don't want us to miss it. Uh, Many cities were built at that time along a water source. 
uh, along a place where there was a river that flew off, or that that would flow often right through the middle of the city, and then they would build on on the banks of the river. And the water that was how they would get their water, and their water was extremely valuable, obviously, uh, to be able to have that water source. And the problem is that it that Jerusalem was not built on that. Jerusalem didn't have that kind of a water source, and so they would actually they actually had systems of bringing water in. But what that did was left them very vulnerable when the enemies would come. If you would, if you remember Sunday, we talked about this idea of the enemy being uh, the enemy surrounding the city and cutting them off. And that's what would happen here is the enemy would surround the city. So the enemy has now surrounded Jerusalem, as we read here in Psalm 46. And it's very easy now to cut off the water supply because there is no there is there's no river flowing in and so the enemy has cut off the water supply and at that point it's easy to to bring defeat to a city so what we see as that outside source of of being able to to care for themselves is taken away but king hezekiah had diverted an an underground spring uh a long ways, I think it was about 1,700 foot, that he had he had diverted this spring so that it would bring water into the city. And the unique thing is that this was completely hidden from the enemy. The enemy had no idea how they were getting water, yet they were being supplied with this water. And this is the idea that's being brought out here in the psalm as he, as he talks about that. He says there was this, this hidden river. It's a picture of God's blessing and fulfillment and contentment. Though outside, it's terrible. Though outside, the enemy is there and ready. We see here that God is providing for them. God has given them what they need and he's given them water. And so then as I studied that, I thought, what will we do as Christians when our outside sources are cut off? Much like we're seeing now. How are we going to respond? How are we going to react when our when our finances are being cut off when we can't work when 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 things get difficult that way what are we going to do when we are cut off from church in a lot of ways what about our spiritual growth unfortunately there's a lot of christians their only their own the only time they get any kind of spiritual food is when they're in church so what are we going to do when when the enemy surrounds us and now our outside ability to provide for whatever our needs may be are cut off? What about other things? Will we find our contentment? Will we find our fulfillment in God? Will we find our fulfillment in what we are already given from the inside? God has given us all we need. And, and so we can be content in that. Um, the other night, Tuesday, actually Tuesday morning, Scott and I were were doing Bible study. We've been working through the walk, and so we have been meeting over the phone, and we'll we'll talk on the phone, and we'll study the Bible together. And it's been really interesting to me that God has seen fit to put us in the chapter of contentment during this time. And, and to be reminded that God has given us all we need, our contentment is to be found in him. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, this verse says that this river makes the city glad. It literally brings joy and cheerfulness. Does God bring us joy and cheerfulness even in these difficult times? Is he all that we need? He should be, but it's a real test. It's a real test to know if if what we say and what we truly feel are the same thing. Not only will he supply our physical need, but he supplies our spiritual need. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. So I want to be very careful because I don't want you to think that I'm downplaying the church. I can't wait to get back together. The Bible clearly tells us that we should be together. The Bible clearly tells us that there is an importance to be a part of a local church. But God has given us what we need that pertains to life and godliness. 
And and it's through the knowledge of God. And we, you and I, can obtain the knowledge of God when we're in his word on our own or in his word with someone else, even if it's over the phone or over a video chat. You see, when when we become surrounded and and we're our outside things are cut off we can still function because we have God and he gives us what we need and and we're prov- and those things are provided for um as as i've thought about this I, i'm going to share with you a verse that i actually wrote down from from tuesday when scott and i were studying uh, because this is an idea that we talked about, he and I, that God has a way of using things like this to remind you and I that we need to rely on him. It's really easy when things are going well to just kind of rely on our own selves and the things that we're providing for ourselves. when the reality is those things have been given to us by God. So and now in this time, we're forced to rely on God. Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9, which we, we looked at out of the walkbook, says, uh, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Lying. Then he says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. So he says, I, I, he's not asking to just be dirt poor. But he's also saying, I, I don't want to be so rich that I don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to have to rely on you for where my, where my food comes from. And that seems like a weird request. But in verse 9, he says this of Proverbs 30. He says, Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So he's saying, Lord, give me just what I need so I don't turn my back on you, whether I've come to trust in myself and forget you or whether I'm so f- poor that I, that I feel as though I'm forced to do to, to go against your law and your, in which you want for me. And so we see kind of this picture here in Psalm 46 of a God who, though the enemy has surrounded them, he's giving them just what they need and it brings joy and cheerfulness. There's one other quick significance that I would like to look at here as we look at this idea of the river, and that comes from the New Testament. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, at this point, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and, and he is offering her living water. And it says in verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So again, he's talking about salvation here. He had asked the this the Samaritan woman for, for a physical drink of water, and then he says, Hey, I have something for you that will cause you to never thirst again. And we again see this picture of God being enough for us doesn't matter what's going on around us. We have the river of life. We have salvation offered to us. And drinking from that river of life is the illustration here. Drinking from that river of life life brings salvation. And what is it that we need besides salvation? Salvation is really all we need. And so we can be joyful in that. We can be thankful for that. Well, as we move on to verse 5, we learn then that God's presence also brings encouragement. It builds us up because God is with us. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. He sh- she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. God is not removed from our situation. Again, back in the first three verses, I think it's verse 3, the very present help. God is not removed from our situation. We never walk through this world alone. God is with us. Paul asks in Romans, he says, what is there that's going to separate me from God's love? And then he lists all of these things and says, none of these things will. Nothing can separate us from God's love. But there is another thought here, again, digging a little bit deeper into culture a little bit deeper into what the writer would have been thinking when he wrote this. And by the way, especially for those of you who might be watching who don't who aren't normally a part of our church, I hope as we go through things like this, you are beginning to see the importance of digging a little deeper into scripture. 
uh, rather than just reading, but but studying and digging deeper because it brings scripture to life. It shows us uh, even more of the meaning of the writer's intent. And so we see another one of those things here. Uh, even in pagan countries and in, in pagan cities, they believed that if their God, small g, if their God was in their temple, that their city was impenetrable. And that as soon as that God was removed from that temple, that their city could fall. And so as the author writes here, he is reminding the people that God is still in the city. God is still in the temple. The presence of God is still with them. And of course, we know that's so much greater meaning even because it's God is not a little wooden or or metal um, shape, but he is he is real and he is powerful. And the fact that that God is with them should be a huge encouragement to them. Um, again, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I was thinking about even in our own lives, in our own lives, the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. The Lord lives in us as Christians. And if God is is dwelling in in the temple, right? Who then can be against us? And so again, taking courage and being fully convinced of who our God is and that God is the one that I can find my contentment and my peace in no matter what happens. God is here. God is with us. And then uh, lastly, I want to look at the idea that God's presence brings protection in verses six or seven. It says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us and Jacob is our fortress, Selah. So we see in this passage that God is stronger than our enemies. It says here, the nations rage. It's the same word that we looked at last week in the first three verses talking about the waves and the sound of the waves crashing and how intimidating that can be. And he's talking about nations that are that are bubbling up, nations that are angry and ready for war, even coming to attack the children of Israel. And and it's it's talking about how intimidating that can be. And I thought, man, as we as we look at the news and we see what God is doing and we see what's happening in the world, it's so easy to hear those nations raging and become fearful. And then it talks about these nations that totter and they fall and and leaders fall and, and leaders are, are built up. And all of this uneasiness is happening. And we look at that and we can become fearful. But I love this reminder. The psalmist says this, God speaks, he utters, and the earth melts. What a picture of the power of our God. He says in in the midst of everything that's going on, if if we think that, that somehow God has lost control of this stuff, just remember that all he has to do is speak a word and it's all over. It's done. So none of this is happening outside of God's control. And again, what went through my mind was the power of the words of God. The same words, the same way that God created this world, the psalmist is saying is the same way he can end it, the same way all of this can be over. And yet, let me remind you as well, as we have been learning that we also have the Bible, which is God's inspired word, which carries with it the same power. And you and I can read that and draw encouragement from that and draw strength from that. And we can we can speak that into the lives of people and let God's word do its work rather than us trying to convince people. What a, what a wonderful picture of the power of God and his words. And then he finishes this section here. Remember I said, last week, that this was split into three stanzas. And so we see, uh, as he finishes up the second stanza, he he just says that God is never going to leave us. He's with us. He's he's right there. Says, uh, the Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our fortress. And when we begin to think through what we've learned about God and his power, would we not then understand that the presence of God is a, would be a terror to the enemies of Israel? The, 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 the presence of God in our lives should be a terror to the enemies. We should be living in such a way that our enemies are fearful because God is with us. Now, this word here, uh, the Lord, is, is the word Yahweh. If you remember in uh, chapter 6 in Foundations, for those of you who worked through that, there was uh, it talked about some of the different names of God there. And this is Yahweh, the self-existent one. Again, being reminded that God does not need us and, and he does not need anything. And so he spoke into existence out of nothing. He spoke into existence the world. And then he could easily speak and it be gone because he does not need us. Yet this is the God who is with us. The God who brings terror to our enemies. So I want to finish today by asking you a question. I want to ask you, what is your enemy today? What are you struggling with? What, what is it that feels as though it has surrounded your life? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it discouragement? Is it doubt? What's attacking you today? God is greater than all of those things, and God is a river that brings joy and gladness. These things that we are being anxious over from the outside, we see in this psalm, we do not need them. We simply need our God. And it's times like this that he often just wants us to be still, as we're going to find out tomorrow, just to be still and know that he is God just to put aside the busyness and the extras and all those things and just realize that God is enough. Again, when we have a proper view of God, we have a proper view of our problems. And I hope this has helped. I hope this is an encouragement to you. We'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing, as we finish up this chapter.